Hello there, my name's Neil David and I'm the host of Eurograps Express, the podcast exclusively dedicated to the wrestling of Europe. If it's wrestling and it happens in Europe and it's good, we talk about it. Whether it's RevPro, Progress, WXW, Passion Pro, Pro Wrestling Chaos, Pro Wrestling North, we don't care, we talk about them all. If it's good and it's exciting, I want to share it with you. We're on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Check us out on the feed. Check us out on Twitter at Eurograps EXP. And join us for chat about European wrestling and a little bit of chat about cheese. Hopefully see you there. Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And joining me here today is a first-time guest for the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. He has emerged really as what I, who I would consider the authority in terms of the space that we're in when it comes to Lucha Libre, certainly when it comes to like American uh, analysis of Lucha Libre. Uh, it's the Cubs fan. You might know him on social media as at Lucha Blog. Uh, you can find his work uh, pretty much all over uh, the wrestling sphere, but you can certainly check out uh, his blog, which is now at thecubsfan.com. Uh, he updates that pretty pretty close to on a daily basis with the latest results and analysis in the world of Lucha Libre, but really happy, happy to have him on my show because there really isn't anyone better to talk about the topic that we're going to discuss today. Uh, Cubs fan, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, no. And thank you for, for, for coming on to the show. And what I wanted to do today was to talk about Lucha Libre, which is really not a topic that we get to too often in the Gentleman's Wrestling Podcast. And that really stems from myself having kind of a, a casual fan's knowledge of Lucha Libre. And I simply don't have as much to say about the major Lucha promotions uh, as I do about topics like WWE and AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. But one of the things that uh, that does not I don't that does not mean that Lucha Libre is not interesting and there's not a lot going on uh, in the major Lucha com- companies and Lucha Libre in the United States and other topics. And there's a lot to cover that we haven't talked about ever on the show. And there's no one better than you, my friend. So I'll start with with this question just to start. We know that the pandemic impacted wrestling. Uh, differently depending on what type of wrestling we're talking about. Wrestling, you know, AEW and WWE, the pandemic meant one thing. Uh, For Japanese promotions, the pandemic meant another thing. The impacts are still being felt strongly in in Japan uh, in a way that they're not really being felt in the United States. Uh, Indie wrestling in the United States was obviously impacted it in a different way. Um, And certainly in Mexico, uh, it it was different as well. Uh, Can you kind of I guess this is a this is a long t- a big ask for the first question, but could you like briefly summarize kind of the impact uh, that the COVID nineteen pandemic had on Lucha Libre, particularly with the two major promotions, uh, AAA and and CMLL? It was pretty devastating uh, compared to the U.S. and Japan. Mexico has a much higher percentage of their re- revenue for Lucha Libre coming from live at- from live events from ticket sales. They get minimal to minimal money from TV and media deals. They have almost no digital revenue, and there have been attempts to do merchandise online, but they really have not really developed in the way that they've gone for a New Japan shop or WWE or AEW. It's a business that was successful, just bringing people into the building and selling stuff to them there, and they it was a hard adjustment for them to deal with not having those people there. Um, you can tell that both companies had struggle just um, continuing on. AAA famously, well, it was not talked about a lot, but they kind of laid off many of their office staff during that time just because they couldn't afford to have office staff. Um, they Both promotions adapted by trying to work with the government to put on 
more televised events or more like things that people could attend safely or that they could still enjoy Lucha Libre. Um, that's when CMLL got into running pay-per-views, internet pay-per-views online that AAA experimented with like drive-in shows for a while. But it really, I think if, if anything, it convinced those, those companies that they need to work harder at finding other revenue sources because when those ticket sales disappear again, if something like that happens or just a downturn of business, they, they know now that they need to find other ways to make money. And my understanding is, particularly with CMLL, particularly with like the the Friday night shows and things like that, those were reliant on on tourists coming into the city. And there's like deals with hotels and resorts that CML has to to, to you know shuttle fans to Arena Mexico as this kind of tourist attraction. And obviously during the pandemic, there's a there was a lot less tourists coming into Mexico City, which probably hurts them in that regard as well. Correct? Yeah. Um, there was, there's actual tour companies that are just built around. We take people to go out drinking on Friday night and then we take them to Arena Mexico and then we get them home safely. And they are charging for those tickets a lot more than um, CMLL is making for those tickets. So there, there are multiple people just making a living off doing the tour stuff, along with the hotel stuff, along with the government having sanctioned um, tour bus that take people just directly from a uh, shopping mall with a luchador on, on, the, on the bus answering questions. And then they go to the show and they could come home from the show for all the um, weekly CML events. Um, not having those and not having the, those fans come in for a while because even when the restrictions started list, getting lifted, it was just people were reluctant to travel for quite a while. Um, hurt, made it a slower recovery for them. Um, I think they've maybe by mid 2022, they started getting those fans back. And you can see that the attendances have picked up considerably. I mean, the estimate that CMLL gives itself is like they have 30% of their fan base on a average Friday night is a tourist fan, either someone coming from outside the country or from other parts of Mexico, just trying to go to a, a Lucha Libre show while they're in Mexico city. And so, if you lose the thirty percent of your attendance every week, that's going to that's going to hurt a lot. Yeah, I was talking to uh, my aunt, and she was telling me that her uh, mother in law, who's like eighty nine years old, and went to Mexico. She said that she went to a lucha libre show, and I was like, "Oh, what what lucha? You know, was it AAA? Was it CMLL?" And obviously, she doesn't know that, but she said she really enjoyed herself. And she's this is not a typical wrestling fan. And that's kind of the charm of, of, of Lucha Libre to an extent uh, at the surface level is that it is something that does appeal to people who are not wrestling fans. Certainly if they're coming to Mexico and want to experience authentic Mexican culture, at least to American tourists, Lucha Libre is seen as a major aspect of that. Yeah, definitely. I think it was... I'm trying to remember the right year, 2016, maybe Mexico City itself um, get announced that that CML and Lucha Libre itself was uh, official cultural representation of Mexico City that they wanted to promote. That like for CML's part is they got a plaque and they were very happy about that. But from that point on, I think that the government and other other tourist groups saw that recognition and started pushing people more and more to go to Arena Mexico or to set up plans for them. And then the style that they run is something that compared, especially compared to AAA, its main competition, um, the Arena Mexico wrestling is very simple to follow. If you don't even know anything about wrestling, if you've never seen a wrestling show, it's like very clear good guys, very clear bad guys. And the action, there's no, lots of interference there's no names you even need to know even though they're trying to make that clear it's just it's the most basic form of wrestling and it makes it easier for someone who's just unaccustomed to wrestling to get into it and enjoy it yes it is famously dave Meltzer's favorite type of wrestling is the paint by numbers approach to to cmll where it's very clear and obvious of what's going on and we talked about the pandemic so shortly before the pandemic in 2019 um you know, Paco Alonso, who is the owner of CMLL and the head decision maker and had been for 
what, like 35 years. Um, he dies. And my understanding is that the kind of decision-making and ownership of CMLL becomes a total mess. His, his daughter is briefly uh, like respond, tries to take over the, the role, but she kind of ends up being muscled out of the company. And then the pandemic hits and there's just all sorts of, the company is kind of in disarray post Paco Alonso death. On t- and then you have the pandemic talking, uh, coming on top of that. But my understanding is that over the last year, that business is really up, that CML is doing quite well. The company is back kind of on a stable ground. Can you kind of describe the kind of, you know, post Paco Alonso death, kind of what's happened with CMLL and kind of how they've found their way back this year? Well, the ownership is is kind of confusing, a little bit complicated. It's the Arena Mexico CMLL or EMLL, as it was known then, was fo- was founded by Stavler Lutheroff in the 1930s. He runs the promotion himself, but he also makes so much money from running the promotion that he gets into real estate and makes tremendously amount more money there where that's their main, that's the Lutheros family's main revenue. And that's why they're super wealthy because of it. He puts Paco Alonso, which I think is one, his nephew and his son, Salvador Lutheroff II in charge of the wrestling and boxing that they're running the arena mexico the box the seller of the second takes the boxing but it does not do well and he goes on to do other things and paco alonso is left alone to run the company himself for a for about 35 years when he passes away he before he passes away he's clearly grooming his daughter sophia to take over but it appears as time has gone by that there were other Lutheran family members who all thought they were going to put their children or put themselves in that position. And the person who's running it now is Salvador Lutheran III, who is the grandson of the original owner. The the second generation um, Salvador was around briefly just to kind of endorse that this is what we're carrying on with the family. And there was even an interview with I forget who did the interview with um, the third Salvador Lutheroff, who's already planning on his own son taking over someday. So it's like, it's a big family. It's a complicated relationship. And uh, I'm sure it's somewhere there's a will or there's a agreement about what was supposed to happen that got changed somewhere along the lines. But that really concerned people who were following CMLL because it had been Paco Alonso for so long and it had been stable ownership and then it changed to multiple people getting involved and who knows who's doing what. But since the end of the pandemic, what the unexpected thing is that they've had a lot of new ideas for a promotion that pretty much does the same thing all the time. And they've made some moves that have really helped things. Um, some of it's just luck. Uh, losing Roosh, losing Dragon Lee, losing the New Wave Generation Diamitas, all those big names seem like a big hurtful deal when they happen, but they open up space for new people to get into more top positions. And they move some people who felt like a big deal out of the promotion. And because they had, they had, they were a big deal. Rush is still a big deal, but he kind of had come stale doing the same stuff. So they got new people in those spots. They got, um, they started focusing on a fewer amount of people on the bigger Friday night shows. It was a promotion that famously cycled people in and out of the of the bigger shows and tried to be more egalitarian about give everyone a chance to work on the shows with the big attendance. And they've gone to a more conventional approach of like, let's just try and make the best show possible. And that means some of the lesser workers or some of the people that are not, the, that the booking department is not as fond of are now less likely to be on those big shows and they group the better people together more often. Sounds simple, but it has made a big difference. And then on the more minor level or a, a more specific level, I mean, the second generation Mystico left the company to become Drillistico and team with his brothers. And it was the best thing that could have happened to the promotion because putting the first generation Mystico back in that role, really, it was something the fans had been asking for for a long time. And you can see that the business started to really pick up with people who wanted to see him as Mystico, people who had grown up as seeing him as the, when he was the megastar in the mid 2000s, now coming back to Reno, Mexico with their kids to see him again in that role. So it, was, it wasn't it was like one 
individual event that did it, but it was a lot of freshening up the product and putting people in better positions than they were before. Yeah, I found, you know, CML's growth this year very interesting because it seemed like they were such a mess like a year ago when you go over some of the stuff that happened. Like they they lose Dragon Lee, who I, I believe if I recall correctly, they, he was lost because he worked a PWG event that also had AAA talent on it, which is a big no-no uh, in CMLL. And by him losing, uh, you know, by him doing that and they, they, they fired him, that ultimately kind of played a role in them losing Rush, who's arguably their biggest star. So he leaves. Um, and then you mentioned, uh, is it the, the D- I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher their names, the D- Dinamitas, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. They um they leave as well. So you lose, not only do you lose arguably your bigger star in Rouge, but you also lose some younger talents that you were hoping to elevate. But what kind of like what you described there is it opened up space on the card for younger guys to step in. So like as an American wrestling parallel, you can say like, you know, when the WWF lost Razor Ramon and Diesel, it opened up space for people like Steve Austin and The Rock to, to step in. And the the other aspect of that is the really fascinating career of the original Mystico, who, you know, in the mid two thousands, like you said, is a gigantic, gigantic star, really one of the biggest stars in wrestling history, and certainly one of the biggest stars in wrestling since the, you know the the end of the Attitude Era, or the start of the two thousands. Um, and you know, he goes to WWE, he's in Cara. Everyone knows how that kind of works out for him. Then he spends years kind of bouncing around Mexico, working different gimmicks because he can't be the original Mystico anymore. And then the the replacement Mystico leaves to go be Drellistico, who people watching AEW and Ring of Honor have seen several times. Um, but the original Mystico's back under the original gimmick, and he kind of picks up where he left off, which is as the biggest star in Mexico. And um, we'll talk about, like, when we talk about, like, Wrestler of the Year and, and those kind of awards, I mean, he has to be in the conversation this year because his success as a top star again in CMLL has been huge and has helped um, that company, you know, get back on stable footing. Yeah, he's been a huge part of it. It's not like they are even investing these huge storylines to get him over. He's just done the very basic, he's the ace. He's the guy that, that everyone believes is the number one guy. And then every so often someone like, steps up to him or or cheats him to win a match and he comes back the next week and wins it in the center of the ring it's it's not a it's not a complicated story but it's the superhero who beats all his enemies story that has worked in mexico going back to the days of el santo and they're just mystico is just doing the more modern version of it and he's doing it in he's obviously excited about being back in this role both having the gimmick and being the top star that's improved his performances, I believe, but um, the fans have embraced it really totally as well. What is it about him that it makes him kind of a, such a big star? Because I never really got it with him. You know, I watch him and I can like when I watch Roosh, like I get why Roosh is a big star in Mexico. He just, I can see his charisma and his work and things like that. I've never really, been able to to put my finger on why you know Mystico is such a big star in Mexico. Why why do you think he has has gotten so over and why he is like this this star kind of without any kind of peer uh, when he's at his best, whether it's back in the two thousands or like like now. I think originally it was because he was the young flying guy who who was pulling off wins that people were surprised by in a similar fashion to Rey Mysterio at the point of his career. But I think now it's more that like, he's the, the, the perfect hero, the guy who's just like, there's no shades of gray to him. He's like completely a good guy. He's completely confident. He's completely willing to be like, silly is not the right word for it but sometimes like the best professional wrestlers are willing to go way over the top to get a reaction and Mystico is the guy who runs completely around the ring to slap hands and raise and, and get everyone cheering I guess like Tana, in a Tanahashi way is the best conspiracy, comparison I could think of but he's a guy that they that he's always confident he 
and he always comes through for them. So, I mean, there are more edgy guys. There are more like guys who um, have more ups and downs, but because he's like the guy that they can rely on to come through in the big moments, I think that's that's the appeal. And he's historically been presented as a big deal, which as we know in wrestling always helps that fans view someone as a legitimate top star. Maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's remembering glory days from the past, but that's a very powerful thing to have over fans of wrestling. And he certainly has that. And especially there has to be like a craving because he spent so much time not in that role, you know, with his his voyage to WWE and kind of his post WWE career before he was able to finally get back to Mystique, being the original Mystico gimmick again. Yeah, there was a definite craving by him. There's still every every interview he does, he talks about it, or seemingly every interview he talks about how he's great. He's so happy to be back. He's so happy to be a top guy again. And all he really wants to do is main event the next big show. He's just always coming up with ideas to go even further, go to the top. Uh, in the, I guess in the same way that New Japan wrestlers might talk about, like this is how this is my path to get to the Tokyo Dome main event. Mystico's always striving to like be in the bigger match, like. He won the, they run a Mexico versus the World Grand Prix every year for both the men and the women. And he won the men's one this past week. And he was very ecstatic about getting the big win and also very interested in trying to see how farther he could push at that. Like maybe we could take, because Rocky Romero attacked him after a match. So he was like, he was trying to pitch, he was clearly trying to get to the next big match with with rocky and there's always there's something there's always a next goal that he's pushing to i think that also helps him you mentioned that you know the departure of people like rush and dragon lee kind of opened up opportunities for for new names to kind of step into the those spots what are some of those new names on cmll that have really seen their career take off in the last year or so atlantis jr is the obvious one he is a son of the longtime um cmll star atlantis he it seemed like a guy that they that the promotion was higher on than he was ready for at first but he's come he can't, they they pushed him as a big star to begin with and eventually he won people over won the more skeptical parts of their fan base over by the time he won stuck junior's mass at the anniversary show last year there are guys who had been around for a while who just like were at the like just underneath the main event level, but got more of an opportunity because there weren't the, the people above them disappeared, like Angel de Oro and Niebla Roja, who are the current tag team champions and were had a great year last year just defending those titles. And then more recently, um, the new Master Dorada, the second version of him, who was previously wrestling as Panter Pantarita Del Ring Jr., they've given him something similar to what Mystico got originally as a push as the young guy who does amazing flying tricks who is pulling off wins that no one expected to win and he's suddenly a top guy out of nowhere yeah i definitely have been following atlantis jr a little bit closely um and he get you're like i was kind of intrigued in like kind of the meta narrative of him being kind of the second generation pushed a little bit too fast um, fans kind of having a natural apprehension to him and then him kind of winning them over. I really enjoyed the Atlantis Jr. Uh, Stuka Jr. Uh, match from last year, if only because I found the contrast very interesting between Atlantis Jr. as like the groomed baby face, you know, next top guy person and Stuka Jr. is kind of like, my understanding is kind of like, you know, a veteran guy that never really got pushed as a main eventer before who's kind of working with a heel. I thought that was an, like a, as a, as a, as a casual fan dropping in, I thought that was a really excellent program. Um, and it's kind of interesting to see Atlantis Jr. Like you said, win over the skeptical, more hardcore fans that were kind of resistant to him at first. Yeah. It, it's, it's especially hard to do that as a young wrestler in, Arena Mexico, because there was that. There's a history of the fan base, especially the fans that support the more real wrestlers, that they want to see, like in their head, they want to see the guy work his way from the first match to the second match, to the third match, to the fourth match over time. And there, there are guys who've done that and gone on to be big stars like Volador Jr. But obviously, there's a, there's a reason a promotion might want to push a guy all the way at the top of the same at at the at the beginning and. It 
that triggers like feelings that these guys, that especially when it's a second generation wrestler of a, and especially a famous second generation wrestler, that there's a, a the fan base worries that like they're just making this guy a star, but he hasn't really proven anything. He doesn't really have the abilities. And that feud with Stucker Jr., especially the anniversary match, did a great job of like showcasing how much Atlantis had those abilities, how much he was willing to risk, even if it meant landing on the barricade doing a dive. So I think that was a very well done program. And I think Stooker Jr., like as a guy who was a career solid mid-card guy who was probably never going to be better than that, has really transitioned well to being at Rudo from in that feud and in the year since. Mm-hmm. Since he's lost his mask. Yes. The um, And that's what I find kind of interesting about CML is like you said, they're really interesting in the sense that their model is so basic and the creative model is so basic that even implementing minor changes um, seem to have made a really big difference in their business. And there's something kind of refreshing about that simplicity where we often discuss booking and, and kind of wrestling creative as like as this rocket science that you could never quite get your hands on. And yet CMLL with only a few kind of basic changes uh, is able to really change their business. And I don't know if that's feasible for any other wrestling company on earth. It seems like every other wrestling company kind of has a has a like a greater demand for a creative output. But because CMLL has kind of established itself as one thing, that making some minor differences really can make a big difference on business. I guess the closest you could say is that maybe WWE is in somewhat similar stance where WWE has really made some moderate changes in the last year and has obviously really helped their business as well. And they're really the two kind of ancient... Yeah institutions in wrestling yeah i i it, it because cml keeps it so basic i think it does make those like slight changes feel like they're bigger deals like um one of the stars for the last 12 months in the promotion has been rocky romero coming in from new japan he had been in the promotion when he was a rookie 20 years ago and they were able to bring some angles off that but one of the angles they did was just like the same birthday cake spot that you see on US TV all the time, but because no one does that, and that's like three steps behind, three steps up beyond what anyone would do in a normal CML show. That just shoving a a cupcake in Boulder's face came off as a big deal. So when you have set ex- expectations at the same level for so long, even varying just slightly makes a huge deal. It's just setting those expectations in the first place sometimes is the problem. And I think that's a really important idea in just wrestling booking in general is you, the wrestling promotions are the ones who set expectations for themselves by delivering uh, any type of consistency in their product, whether that's consistently good or whether it's consistently bad. And that often is kind of what you're working against if you are a booker or a creative mind in a company is what are fans expecting and can we deliver on those expectations and can we exceed those expectations? And it doesn't really matter if it's inherently good or inherently bad. It's more about how can you how can you operate against the expectations that have already been set. Um, and it's really interesting to just kind of look across the, the board and see a company like CMLL that really understands what kind of product they're presenting um versus other companies that uh maybe don't understand what product they're presenting nearly as well and we're going to talk about one of those companies in a second yeah i i think cmll knows what's what it's trying to do and it's trying to do the best version of its promotion i think in i think one big difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic is that they're making a better effort of, of 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 doing the best version of the promotion and and, and changing a few things to make it better. Uh, where like in the late two thousand tens, it was more they they were just doing what they always do, and they were not putting as many they weren't putting as much effort into it. And I think maybe that is another fact that you can look at the pandemic is that they can't they realized that they were playing with a a pat hand too long and the attendance was slowly trickling down and it got them to realize that if we're going to bring people back, we want to make sure that we have something that they're going to stick around for. But being consistent in that way and like knowing who they are and knowing what they're, what kind of wrestling they're trying to do, that they're trying to do something that 
that appeals to the fan that does not watch wrestling all the time as as much as it appeals to the fan who may have followed Rocky Romero and Boulder for 20 years to get back to, the, to them facing off again is that's the, that's their strength is that they know what kind of promotion they want to be. I want to pivot to AAA for, for a minute here. Um, AAA, of course, is the other big, you know, major Lucha promotion in Mexico. Uh, Cubs fan, how would you describe AAA's past year? It's it's mixed. If you ask AAA, AAA believes that they're killing it. They did three triple manias that did over like 12,000 attendance, higher than that if we believe the numbers they give us. Um, they also did a, what is that called? They did a World Cup that also drew a big house early in their year. Um, and they feel like they're, they're, provide, they're doing the kind of matches that their fan base likes. If you read anyone who watches the show, um, not just in English, but even like for the most recent Triple Main, there was a lot, a lot of same similar feeling in Spanish that that the matches that they're providing aren't really good. That the shows are becoming more of a chore to watch because of production choices they're making, and that they are slipping further. They are not giving the product that the people want to see that the strength is more that they have these established brands like the name triple mania but that they are they are, have gone downhill uh, a fair bit in like the last 12 months mm -hmm. yeah the production choices i feel like when i talk to people um, or see people talking about triple a especially in the united states the production comes up a lot whether it's the commentary whether it's the camera work i know like a big thing now is that the the commentary plays like through in the arenas as fans are sitting there, like fans can hear the commentary. Is that, that's right? That's right. It's something they started to do on their empty arena tapings during the pandemic. And no one thought of it as any strange thing because there's no fans. So you might as well hear the announcers, but then they just did not stop doing it. Once the fans came, the reasoning, the most recent explanation for the reasoning is that they feel they have a lot of casual fans who do not know the storylines or do not understand what's going on so that they need to do the commentary over the over the audio system to make sure that they're that those fans feel part of the programming and it's not for the knowledgeable fans but i don't really know if i buy that reasoning seeing that seeing many other promotions have casual fans who don't know what's going on but they like the wrestles themselves are there to kind of explain who's why you should be caring about all of this yeah, I mean, don't give Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn any ideas because we're. I could see them putting Michael Cole's voice over the PA uh, system to to explain absolutely everything that's going on. I guess you only have to look, you know, at CMLL, which, like you said, is what like thirty percent of their fan base is is tourists coming into the city who maybe have never seen a wrestling show in their life, yet they're able to interact and understand what's going on because the product is presented like that. And if your your idea is our product is so complicated or convoluted that we need to have an announcer explaining everything to people all the time. That seems like a booking issue and not necessarily a, an information issue from a commentary perspective. Yeah, that's, that's where my mindset is on both the things that I don't think that, I think AAA just likes to try things also that like no one else tries just to see if they will work for them, but they are slow to give up on ideas when they're obviously not working. And it was clear from a lot of the, the reactions I saw from people who attended the most recent triple mania in Mexico city that listening to that commentary for four hours, it, it it's bad for us watching the stream because it makes, the audio mixing makes it so that we can hear the announcers and not the crowd making the reactions. But even if you're in the crowd, just hearing those guys be at a Gus Johnson level 10 for four hours, just, it just wears on you and makes you less excited for the show as it goes on. Yeah. I can imagine that it like, it's, it's a novel maybe for a minute and then for four hours. And especially if you're a re returning customer, uh, it's, it's, it is, it's like you said, in AAA is kind of, AAA's whole existence in some ways is based off of the contrast to CMLL. Would you say that's fair to say uh, that that is the case? Yeah, uh, AAA's origin story is that 
Televisa wanted to do more modern wrestling and then CMLL would not give it to them. So they went down the organizational chart until they found Antonio Pena, who's willing to give them the more modern style. And they, the early AAA, the stuff they add definitely is stuff that, um, that CMLL, there's parts of that that they've definitely adapted over the years. But as they've experimented more, sometimes they haven't hit as well. And the AAA product is typically much more violent, uh, like you said, more experimental. You'll see like more like kind of American style booking practices rather than than traditional Lucha Libre. And it's interesting idea in the sense of, especially if you're an American fan watching Lucha Libre, uh, seeing AAA kind of, some, to me, it sometimes often comes across like a bad American promotion as opposed to a Lucha promotion. And the appeal uh, of it is 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 diminishing uh, because of that because I don't need another bad American wrestling promotion. I would like if I'm going to be watching Lucha Libre, I want to see Lucha Libre. Yeah, the thing about that is that if you have a conversation with Conan about about that, who is the lead booker for that promotion for AAA, he believes he's doing Mexican wrestling, that this is the Mexican wrestling that the Mexican wrestling fans will want to see, that they want to see, that he's been booking long enough that he knows that the fans will react to run-ins, they'll react to the referee heel spots, they'll react to the different weapons. But I think if you talk to the people who run CML, they would say, no, we're doing Mexican wrestling, and they're not. And it's it's, I think, really what the fans will accept, both in Mexico and America, depends on, it can vary a lot from people to people. And, and like, you can offer them very different things and you can find fans who will want to see it. I think the, the issue with AAA is that they have this, uh, Conan is a person who keeps up with modern wrestling. You can listen to this podcast if you want to listen, hear him keep up with modern wrestling, but also he relies on, tropes and things that work from the mid nineties. He's very still ECW influence in what he provides. He's very Vince Russo, WCW air feels like a lot in his product. And while some of those things absolutely worked in their time, it's he, he's, there's like a dade feeling to the programming because he's over on some of those things that, that used to work and do not work as well now. Um, but the other issue and this is an issue for Mexico is that there's not a lot of proven booking talent because we've only, only had two major promotions and CML runs a promotion that like no one else runs and they haven't had much turnover. And AAA has had Conan and has Antonio Pena and has had a few other people helping along the lines, but there's not like another option you could go out there and find. There's not a like, there's not a group of former AAA writers, like there's a four, group of former WB writers who seem for a while to get called whenever the new promotion wanted to start. There just isn't a diversity of opinions or options to make, to give people different ways to book promotions. Yeah, and it's a very uh, difficult aspect of the industry and me and Garrett Kidney talked about a lot of this we were talking about TNA and how TNA when it was always looking for someone to run creative they were digging up someone from the past or someone that you know like Dusty Rhodes or Vince Russo um, and these people and you know Bruce Pritchard and these people that had ideas but they were mostly outdated ideas but where are you going to find there's there's it's hard to find someone who has a track record that's going to impress an executive um that isn't relying on stuff from the past uh and it what it led to is kind of like a lack of creative development in american wrestling and i'm sure mexican wrestling is no different um like Tony Khan is the first like new creative mind to really pop into American wrestling in quite some time. And he was only able to do that because he's personally, you know, has enormous personal wealth. Um, if you're AAA, it's like, all right, we need new ideas. Where are you getting them from? I guess you could look at people on your roster and see who, which, who wrestlers are people that want to, to, to take a role in creative, but you're right. And it's interesting like Conan has this like kind of pseudo modern approach to booking where 
he might be more modern than CMLL in the sense that CMLL is presenting a classic product that dates back, you know, to the 1930s. Um, but he, in his own way, he is like just as dated by presenting stuff that would have worked 30 years ago in the 1990s. We are now far past that. And there's generations of fans that don't remember Conan, the giant star of AAA in the 90s. Um, and certainly don't remember like WCW and ECW. And how are you going to reach those fans when your product has aged badly? Yeah. The the one time that AAA tried to go outside of that traditional um, Conan, Antonio Pena viewpoint was there was a year where Conan was out of the promotion for reasons. And so they gave the responsibility to Vampiro and before long, Vampiro actually had the Lucha Underground head writer, Krista Joseph, if you remember that name, um, as ghostwriting the promotion. And that all, that showed the difficulty of bringing someone else in because while Lucha Underground at times was very was very critically successful, it was never ring successful really, but it was, it was something that did do a good job of building stars like Pentagon and Phoenix and other names on that show. Um, Booking for in a Mexican promotion in a Lucha Libre style is different from what De Joseph had done with Lucha Underground itself and different from his experience when he was a WWE writer. Um, I think ultimately Vampiro and De Joseph lost the job because Vampiro was bad at the personnel management, which is also a huge part of being a booker, more than in the, even the creative was not good, but the personnel management was probably far worse. But it's even if you look for an outsider, like Tony Khan is an outsider because he he knows what, he's an outsider in multiple ways because he has the money to put himself in that position. But if you found someone you thought was had a Tony Khan level of wrestling intellect that you wanted to suddenly put into a AAA position, m most of the people who would be that sort of qualified don't have the history and knowledge of what works in Mexico to match with what their wrestling knowledge is. It's it's a small subset of people who would even fit in that role, and then they would also have to deal with the different ways that AAA works compared to any other promotion. So it's it's a very tough job to fit to you, Phil. And I understand why even when Conan's ideas feel dated and just do not seem to work as well, that they're reluctant to move on from him because their experience of moving on him hasn't been good and there's just not, it's it's a very specific position to fill. Like as a as a fan, like do you enjoy Conan's product? No, I, Conan, Conan, apparently I've not listened to Conan's podcast. This week. Um, apparently he has feelings about my feelings about the product that, that he made very clear for about five minutes. I have to look forward to that. But like I, I enjoy, we agree because he's a person who understands that there has to be at least one traditional, maybe not good match, but like high flying fireworks show. And he tries with he either built that around Vikingo or he built it around Commander or someone like that. But the rest of the promotion, it feels like there's an over-reliance on um, U.S. heels coming in to insult all the Mexicans because that was something that he was to himself in the 90s as part of Los Gringos Locos. There's the the women's wrestling is pretty much a sideshow. There's an over-reliance on bringing in outside names to pop to try to get um, outside fans to care, but that the regular roster just has a, a similar situation to what WWE was going through through many years where at WrestleMania, the guys who had worked all year would be shoved into m matches of lesser importance while the first, The Rock or whoever else was coming in got the top spots. And you kind of, as a person, if you're just jumping in for the WrestleMania, cool, I get to see The Rock versus John Cena. That's all I really care about. But if you're a person who follows the promotion 365 days, you're upset that the Octagon Junior Volano 3 feud that you've been watching all year just gets pushed into a battle royal because they don't really have a spot for it on the big show. And I think that's some of my some of my issues or pain points with the with the with the current promotion. Um, but it's also a, a situation where I don't think Conan really cares what people like you or me think of the promotion because he feels like that. In the building, he hears the good reactions, and that's really all that matters for him right now. Those are fans that he's really care, cares about appealing to. Is he hearing the good reactions, or is he hearing Hugo Zavetovich's voice? 
that's that's a good question. I I know he famously told said after the last Triple Mania Tijuana show that he talked to 25 different people and all 25 of them after the show told them that it was a great show. So he's doing some hardcore polling that, you know, Gallup would approve of. Yes, breathlessly reported in the, in the Wrestling Observer newsletter. I don't know how Dave got that scoop, but he did. Um, I Kind of you mentioned like, you know, Vampiro, uh, you mentioned that he lost his job because he didn't handle the personnel correctly and that's obviously a huge part of the job and that's kind of one of the fascinating aspects of wrestling in mexico to me is that it is in a lot of ways like stepping back in time and it's like the territory days guys walking out of contracts guys refusing to do jobs it seems very different than in what we've come to expect in like major american wrestling and part of that is it has to come down to like you know the economics of of the business and how it's different there than it is in in the u.s and it seems to me like there is a issue in the sense of guys realizing they can make more money in the u.s in certain cases and is that do you see that as kind of like an existential threat to Lucha Libre in Mexico? Or do you think that as a healthy evolution of the business that some guys can leave and create spots for new people It's definitely an evolutionary threat because obviously AAA would be seeing like Phoenix and Penta and Rush and other people who have are now in AEW more often than their promotion. And, and they clearly feel like it's like AEW is, an, is a partner, but also an issue for them in the same way I guess New Japan might feel the same way where they're losing some of their top stars every year because they get, they cannot afford to bid with, AEW on those names. Um, there's some ways that both of those companies, I think, probably could handle their own business better. I know that many of the AAA stars, many people people associate with AAA or see on TV all the time are not actually under contracts. There's a lot of Mexican wrestling is like the territory days, where there's a lot of handshake deals or verbal commitments that will give you four more dates and or will see you on this date that, that allow those both AAA and CML to have a lot of flexibility in what they're doing and not be owed as much money in case shows don't happen, but also leave them very vulnerable to think to people not people changing your mind and nothing holding them back. It came up with this past Triple Mania sequence where Rush made it public that he was going to show up for one of the matches and quietly it was revealed that Rush really had no guarantee that it was going or no necessary necessarily had to show up because he would never signed a contract with the promotion the tr- promotion never triple a never thought oh we have to lock this guy down because we're having a main event for two of our next three shows but the u.s is always gonna be a, a bigger issue um unless the mexican promotion will grow greatly in size or that they they find a way to tap money in the U.S., be media deals or touring or whatever, they're always going to be at risk that their top stars are going to just be, disappear at any point to WB or AEW. Um, they just, they don't have the revenue to compete. And so pushing the young stars, pushing a Vikingo or a Commander or a Masker Dorada, or um, I'm trying to think of another name here, I'm, I'm blanking, but all those guys, they're pushed, but as soon as you push them as top stars, there's like a invisible countdown clock that's coming until someone in AEW or WWE decides, catches on to Mexico, which takes longer than you than Japan, but eventually they, they make a buzz for themselves. Maybe they have to go to Japan, maybe they have to go to the US, but eventually there's a clock going, ticking down until they make their offer that the promotions themselves cannot compete with. And you have to if the promotion is on the ball, which arguably if they ever are, but if, if they're on the ball, they know that they have to get the most out of this wrestler, this young promising wrestler right now, because they know two or three years ago from now, they might not have access to that wrestler. And I think, I don't know that's a, that's a problem that's going to be easily fixed unless um, suddenly like AAA lose out their dreams and becomes a big name in the US touring. They're just not going to be able to compete with those groups. Yeah, it's a very interesting dynamic in the sense that who I do think the Mystico experiment 
is really interesting in the sense of Mystico was this gigantic star in Mexico. Um, and he got signed to WWE and his career really just pancakes and falls flat on his face. And it kind of is interesting in that it gives off the impression that it doesn't necessarily matter how big of a star you are in Mexico, you might have to start from ground zero in the U.S. It's a little different AEW because AEW at least acknowledges Mexican wrestling in a way WWE really doesn't. And the AEW fan base, some of them will will know the Mexican wrestler uh, coming in, like a wrestler like Vikingo, for example. Um, but I wonder how much time how times have changed in that sense of like mexican wrestlers uh in the major american promotions and kind of how that looks because i think they have two different approaches and i kind of wanted to touch on that and i'll start with the sense of i'll, I'll ask you this like who do you think does a better job promoting like lucha talents wwe or aew It's tough. I, I think at different points in the recent past, I would have said either one. I think obviously with the the success the LWO group has had and the popularity they've had in WWE, it feels like they're the stronger group. But then when you look down at it, it is ended up being something to get Rey Mysterio over. It's not like they're developing. They, they have Santos Escobar as part of the group, um, but they haven't pulled the trigger on making him actually the star of the group. And you can see... They've had Anel Garza and Humberto Correo up on the main roster, and they have not done particularly well. It looks like they're getting another shot in NXT right now. Um, Dragon Lee just started, and they seem to be doing okay with him. But like a similar star to Dragon Lee, if he came from the U.S. Indies or from Japan, I don't know if they would be like starting him off at the low level of NXT competing for the secondary title, or if they would have had him as a uh, bigger star in that, or if they would have had him challenging for a top pile or even like being on the main roster quickly. But um, with AEW, they do focus on the Mexican wrestlers more. And it's obvious that Tony Khan, um, I know this firsthand, really likes the Lucha Libre talent. He's really a fan of what they do and believes that them doing their style can create exciting matches for TV. But the flip side is that he puts them on to have exciting matches, but they're usually the B side of whatever match. And, you know, Commander does some basic stuff and then he loses to another match. Um, I think he's, he's won maybe one match and lost nine on TV or something like that. Uh, Bandito, the same way, where Bandito didn't seem like he got many big wins before his before his injury. And like Lucha Brothers have done well at times, and other times have just kind of faded back into the mix. I, I think there's. I, I think WB is more like stuck on the notion that they really have to make a Hispanic star. So they're going to keep trying these guys with the idea that they might make them the star, but then they will eventually back off at some point when they decide that they don't speak English enough to make it work. So it's going to be a more inconsistent promotion promotion with WB and AW you can see more regularly, but I don't know that AW sees any of the Mexican wrestlers as something, some guy who will be, in their mix for the top titles. I think they see them as a fun part of the show, but not a top part of the show. So it, it feels like it's two different strategies. I don't know that either of them are going to uh, go all the way with a Mexican start unless someone just knocks them over and forces the issue. Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic to me in the sense of like AEW really should be better pushing Mexican talent in the sense of like, like you mentioned, like Tony Khan likes typical lucha libre style and when they bring those guys in they basically let them do what they do in mexico without really any directions to do otherwise um they're allowed to be themselves they're allowed to do what got them over in the first place in a way that in a freedom that isn't allowed in wwe yet like you said aw really despite you know aw having many top mexican wrestlers signed to their roster um AEW really hasn't pushed any lucha talents in a significant way. Like no one to me in AEW um, 
has been pushed the way like Konosuke Takeshita has gotten a push in 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 AEW and Takeshita like some of the lucha talent is you know coming from another country his English might not be that strong things that would typically be a limitation to to getting a major push from American television um he is getting you know a pretty strong push and I haven't and I wonder, will AEW ever do that? Because they have the access to talent. And unlike WWE, they seem willing to let that talent be themselves. Yet they haven't done that. WWE, on the flip side, um, seems to want to try to make a top Mexican star. Um, but they're running into the issue of the fundamental problem that like they hate Lucha Libre. Uh they want a Hispanic star, but they like don't like like anything to do with traditional lucha libre. Um, you know, they want to make uh, a top Hispanic star to connect with the Hispanic market, but they also want someone who is good looking and tall and speaks good English and wrestles the style that they want to wrestle. And Lucha Libre is going to produce many, many diverse talents, but it's simply not going to diverse to produce a lot of tall, good looking, you know, great English speaking guys that can wrestle WWE house style. Um, but they want to to mold someone into doing that. And it's why they were so infatuated with Del Rio for a long time was because he did check those boxes. Yeah, I, I and I think eventually what WWE really wants is they want to find a Mex they're going to someday find their Mexican American star who can do the promos and then they'll hopefully is athletic to do the wrestling the style they want. But until then, I think Dominic they, Mysterio, they're going to keep already found trying him. to find yeah, uh, they're going to keep on trying to find the like the next Rey Mysterio because they feel like that's a that's an archetype that could work again. But I don't think they're going to ever invest the, the resources and the get someone. So, Cubs fan, you're kind of cutting out right now um, on my end. I don't know if you want to leave and, and, and come back. That might be better. Um, this is, this is going to come across as terrible audio, but we're not editing it. Um, so uh Cubs fan left. He's gonna come back. I'm I apologize for that absolutely awful audio that will not be edited. We're leaving it in there. Um but to Cubs fan's point, like when he was talking about Rey Mysterio and they're trying to re like always try to find the next Rey Mysterio, and they have signed a lot of guys over the years that were, you know, masked high flyers and They've taken the mask off some of them. They took it like they took off, El, you know, took it off El Andrade and they took it off um, Phantasma. But the idea is to, and it was, it's kind of an annoying idea to me that they are um, trying to identify, like every Mexican wrestler that they have kind of has to be pigeonholed into the, the, the masked superhero look. And it obviously worked for Rey Mysterio, but that is kind of an outdated, you know, character. And there are a lot different types of characters that um, Mexican American fans and regular American fans can gravitate towards beyond just the Rey Mysterio masked superhero type. Um, Cubs fan is back now. Cubs fan, can you hear me okay? I cannot hear you if you were talking. Oh, okay. Okay, you're good now. I'm not sure. I thought I was talking. Let me. Okay. Okay, we're really off. The... Or do you need me to start talking? No, I mean, I was just, you, I was kind of pontificating on like the Rey Mysterio archetype as being something that they are chasing after. 
Um, and kind of, I guess my point is that that's kind of an outdated archetype, like the mass superhero. And there's a lot more versatility. There's a lot of different roles that Lucha Libre wrestlers could serve. And it's kind of a disservice to just sign another small high flying guy with a mask and hope that he turns into the next Rey Mysterio because the next Rey Mysterio isn't coming. They've been trying to replace him for almost 20 years now. Yeah, and the next room, it's tough to be the next Rey Mysterio when the original Rey Mysterio is still there. I mean, that was the problem with the second Mystico. I, he was a good wrestler, Drillistico, but everyone knew the real Mystico was out there and eventually he came back. And the there was no way the second generation one was ever going to surpass the first one. And, and he could be five times as better, but he does not have the history or the memory of the original one. Um, it would be best for for WB to go to a different role. And I think ultimately they would be happier if they found someone who, who is a more traditional wrestler who happened to be Mexican-American that they could portray as a Mexican star. I wonder, like, had Seth Rollins come along 10 years later, if they would have played that part of his character up more or his back, that part of his, his background. But I, I think that's ultimately the, the kind of star that's going to fit their promotion better. Is Seth Rollins Mexican American? I thought he was. I thought Colby Lopez was Mexican American. Yeah. Maybe I remember I'm hearing that he was um, seeing with somebody else. Th- yeah, I, I hope remember. I, I hope I just did not offend Seth Rollins. I remember hearing that he um like he I know his last name is Lopez, which is obviously uh, Latino. Uh, but he, uh, I remember reading that like he has that last name, but he's actually like Armenian or something. Like he's actually not Mexican American. Like his the last name is like the last name of his stepdad or something like that. Um, yeah, Wikipedia is agreeing with you. So I, I apologize, Seth Rollins. Maybe I'm thinking of Paul London. Let's use Paul London as an example. Paul London three more inches of height. That would work. Yeah. Well, you know, like. Yeah, obviously it's not Mexican American, but they did find I think something where they they signed Damian Priest, who is tall and speaks good English and Latino, um, and wrestles the way they want someone to wrestle. Um, I always thought it was interesting that they didn't give him, uh, they gave him like an Anglo-Saxon name instead of giving him a Latin name. Uh, I personally would have kept his name punish- as Punishment Martinez because I thought that was an awesome name. Um, but that is someone that they're trying to. F- like push into that role kind of and obviously he's the money in the bank holder and he got at least the rub from uh you know working with bad bunny which is a uh you know i know brad bunny is a is is a is a you know from puerto rico and is it maybe a different culture than mexican american culture but is at least a, a spanish speaking star and but he's also like i think over 40 years old at this point so I, I don't know where that next person that they're going to find from Mexico is going to be. I have a hard time. It's going to be like Dragon Lee getting the rocket, you know, rocket strapped to the moon. No, I think he's so what doesn't fit their style that they're going to eventually trouble accepting, working him in. Um, yeah, I, I think they're just going to have to, I think maybe the long-term future is that they get lucky with an NL, NIL person that they're bringing in. And that they the fits a profile that they're looking for because I don't see them finding the right guy in Mexico that they want to bring in. There's not even like an obvious candidate in CMLL or AAA that would um, immediately fit what they're looking for either. So I, I think it's probably going to come from a different direction. Yeah, that, well, that would require their performance center to actually produce some top talent too. If it's going to be someone from one of the, the you know, a, a college football lineman or someone that they train to wrestle, um, I kind of thought that you know, and he was in, uh, he was in Lucha Underground, but I always kind of thought that um, Tejano was like an interesting potential American TV wrestler. I know I never really worked out that end and he's probably too old at this point. But when I first saw him, I was like, this is a guy I could see getting a push on American TV. Yeah, I, I think he would have. It was he was not a guy who I felt like got well, some of the guys got chances and impact and other promotions. Then for whatever reason, it did not work out for Teano. But he works a style that's more fitting with the U.S. wrestling style. I know his English was not very good at that point and he since worked on it. But I think that there's probably, that's probably maybe more of a model of someone who could work in the U.S. as a 
in the way that the US, a WWE promotion would want to a Mexican wrestler to work. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you like a broader question about Lucha Libre in the US in that if you go back and read a lot of stuff from like 20 years ago, everyone's hot take at like the turn of the millennium for wrestling is that Lucha Libre is going to become huge in the United States. And they all use the logic that, you know, the Hispanic demographic is the fastest growing demographic in the United States. Um, there are more and more, you know, uh, Hispanic speaking households in, in the United States every day. And they you know, Mexican wrestling is a, is a, is a huge industry in Mexico and that's underserved in the United States. And that like Lucha Libre is like the next big thing in the U S and over the past 20 years, that really hasn't been the case. And, you know, in, you know, amongst hardcore wrestling fans, you know, that, that have emerged, you know, talking on forums and things like that, it seems like Puro Japanese wrestling is is much more popular than Lucha Libre, and like I'm curious to know as someone who has kind of taken on that mantle as being a voice of Lucha Libre, you know, in the online wrestling fandom, why do you think that Lucha Libre hasn't taken off in the United States? Whether it's Lucha promotions in the U.S. or the major U.S. promotions using more Lucha talent and presenting a more Lucha based product. Why do you think that, like, over the last 20 years, Lucha Libre never took off the way that so many people seem to think it was going to? I think, to some extent, the Lucha Libre, the concept has taken off. I, I think the Mexican style of wrestling is probably more is more popular in the U.S. than the Japanese style of wrestling as a general concept. Like, you'll see TV shows ref reference Lucha Libre. The Cassandra movie, I just had their trailer today. It will, there was, there's cartoons and other stuff where the general concept of Lucha Libre is possible, is popular, but I don't think the brands itself are as popular in the U.S. I think um, there's not a strong affinity for AAA. There's not a strong affinity for CMLL, um, even compared to like a New Japan, New Japan speak or compared to, especially compared to a uh, U.S. promotion. I, I think that the promotions themselves have had a hard time consistently exporting themselves to the U.S., where um, they they don't have much English language content. They're not as accessible at times for for outside fans. Even though for a long time both promotions were like doing their big shows on YouTube, it just felt like there was a there was a learning curve that was bigger there because there weren't. U.S. stars that fans knew coming over, like they come over to New Japan or, or NOAA, where they those are an entry point for those kind of fans to get in. Um, and I think that the promotions, like CML does not care about as much about expanding to the U.S. as maybe a Japanese promotion does. And I think they were at AAA when they've done it, they've done it hit or miss, and they've had like stabs at doing stuff and then disappearing for months in a way where it's, it makes it hard for people to build up interest for them. I think you can look at, there There have been some successes. Obviously, like I think Lucha Underground was probably as popular or around as popular as maybe, maybe, maybe a little less than what New Japan was doing on Access for a while. And if you could present, the, co the commonality of those is that they were both pre presentations of that style of wrestling in an English language format in a way a little closer, maybe not exactly how Lucha Libre was presented in Mexico, but close, but enough of that and enough of what US fans expected to see. In the same way that New Japan made their shows a little bit easier to follow, especially those early access shows when they had the interviews with the wrestlers to get so people identified with them more. And I don't think that work has been done consistently on a Lucha Libre uh, on a Lucha Libre platform, even when they had TV on basic cable or when it was on Galavision in the US. It was stuff that if you knew these guys, you understood why they were fighting and what they were about, but they are not as good as selling the ideas for everyone. And I, I think the other thing is that Japanese wrestling, especially 90s, OOs, tens, it was more worked more on the structure compared comparable to US wrestling, where there was always a few months, or there was a tour building to a big show, and then another tour building to another big show that worked 
in a way close to the US pay-per-view model where Lucha Libre would just have TV shows and then sometimes they would build the big events, but sometimes they just run TV and TV and TV for months. They're just regular shows where you don't have the big matches or the big cycle that people are used to that provide the big jumping in points where everyone's really excited about a Russell Kingdom, but they may not get the same feeling about see they may not have the same excitement about a triple mania because the triple mania matches just came about in the few weeks before and the Russell kingdom was a since the g1 was building towards this big moment i think it's just it's somewhat a presentation it's somewhat a branding issue of getting those brands over in the u.s and i think it's um just somewhat just an exposure of not having that english language exposure that the uh, help people get used to watching the show or aren't really fans of Red Yeah, it's um an interesting thing to me is uh like when we talk about like demographics and like I'm sure like you know 20 years ago people are looking at the US demographics and they're seeing oh you know Hispanic households, Mexican American households are on the rise. Um, that's gonna be the next big thing. But as we've seen over the last 20 years, not just in wrestling, but kind of across culture in general, like, you know, Spanish speaking uh, television is very popular in the United States, but seems to have almost no footprint outside of the Spanish speaking community. Um, you know, Liga MX, um, you know, does very well television ratings uh, in the US. But uh, when you were to um, turn it on to like, uh, um, I don't know, like, if you looked at the TV ratings for network television, like sometimes SmackDown will get beaten by whatever is on Univision. Like it's not necessarily wrestling, but it's always, you know, very competitive with what's on NBC and Fox and ABC. And that makes a broader point in the sense that that culture is kind of isolated uh, in a certain vacuum of uh, like our, our our general pop culture, and it doesn't cross over to the same rate that um, other things do. And I think wrestling is a uh, unfortunately a uh, negative uh, um, consequence of that, and that's probably prevented Lucha Libre from growing. I do think you make a really good point about like the style of wrestling is more prevalent in the United States than maybe like luchadors themselves like if you watch any wrestling promotion right now in the u.s in wwe AEW, any andy um you'll see guys doing lucha libre moves um you'll see guys doing uh hurricanranas and things like that and that is all you know consequences of lucha libre influence uh on american wrestling um Cubs fans now gone I believe his technical difficulties have probably shut down his service um but that's fine because we're going to wrap this episode anyway um I want to thank him for coming on to the show I want to thank all the listeners uh who have been out there listening to these shows I apologize for the technical difficulties that we had but um hopefully uh you still enjoyed the episode and I think we had a really good discussion so appreciate uh everyone who's been listening and obviously thanks to Cubs fan I get I want to say yeah you can follow him um on Lucha blog you know on social media and you can check out his website um which again is you know thecubsfan.com where he does you know pretty much daily updates on pretty much everything you want to know so if you liked what you heard and you want to learn more about lucha libre it's definitely the place to check it out uh, appreciate everyone and i will see everyone again in the future Hello, do you like New Japan Pro Wrestling? Are you a Shin Nihon freak? If so, check out the Super J Cast with Joel and Damon on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. And even if you fucking hate New Japan Pro Wrestling, listen to the Super J Cast anyway. Not just for our great show reviews, analysis, and pastrami sandwiches, mm-hmm. but there's also usually some dick jokes somewhere in the obligatory opening 30 minutes of absolute nonsense we chat about every single week. That's the Super J Cast for all. All the best talk about New Japan Pro Wrestling, crisps, and pornography. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. 
every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi, along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio.